There are two basic bacterial cell shapes, even though there's a lot of variation within those shapes and perhaps arrangements that can be taken on by those shapes, we can put all bacteria into these two basic shapes. The first is the caucus. The caucus would be the singular for many cocci. And these are basically spherical shaped cells. This is going to be, say for example, your quintessential example might be staphylococcus, right? We've all heard of staph infections and the cocci that cause that are one example of these round spherical sort of ball shaped cells. The the other category are the bacilli. Bacilli is another term for rods. If you have just one, it's a bacillus. So the singular form of that word is bacillus. Let's look at the arrangements that the cocci can take on. Arrangements are more likely within um, the cocci shape than we see within the bacilli, though you can sometimes see arrangements there. Let's begin when you have an arrangement where it's simply two cocci right next to one another. This is simply called diplo, so pretty straightforward arrangement there. Now, the diplo arrangement can be indicative of certain genera. So genera, that word is the plural for genus. So remember talking about the binomial system. The genus name in this case is Neisseria um, that, I'm that I'm giving as an example of something that does form a diplo arrangement. So certain species within Neisseria are pathogens that cause gonorrhea and meningitis. So a very famous uh, organism because of that. Diplo arrangement two cells side by side. Oftentimes though we can get many cells in a long chain. That is, um, it's like pearls on a string. So this particular arrangement is what we call a strepto arrangement sometimes or just simply chains. This is a very, in, uh, there are certain genera that tend to have this arrangement. One of those is streptococcus. So when you think about strep throat, right? That's caused by one species in the genus streptococcus. It's called streptococcus pyogenes. So strepto, the strepto arrangement is sometimes a term that's used to describe the chain arrangement. But be careful with that term because Streptococcus is not the only genus that can form chains. Enterococcus and Lactococcus can also form chains of cells and so different genera can still form that long sort of beads on a, on a string. This is indicative of cells that divide repeatedly in a single plane. Now some cells will divide repeatedly in random planes, in multiple planes, and then we get an arrangement that looks more like a grape-like cluster. This is more indicative of um, genera like Staphylococcus and Micrococcus, and sometimes in fact this is called the Staphylo arrangement. But again, being cautious with that, because Micrococcus can also form that arrangement. Another arrangement that is typical of certain lactic acid bacteria, um, we call them the lab for short, um, the lactic acid bacteria will often form tetrads, meaning that they divide in two planes. Sometimes cells will divide in three planes, and then we get an arrangement that's sometimes called sarcina or packet of eight. Sarcina is one genus that has this sort of indicative arrangement. So those are the arrangements that we can see within the world of the cocci. Let's look at some of the um, types of bacilli that we can see. For example, sometimes we see cells that look a little like a coccus and a little like a bacillus, and we can call them, you guessed it, coccobacilli. Um, so when they're kind of rod-looking uh, cocci or cocci-looking rods, that's the name we give them. Sometimes we see rods that look almost like a sliver of a moon. Uh, these are called vibrios. We see that the genus vibrio has this particular shape. So that's, um, I guess, one genus that you see that um, particular morphology. Spirilla, this is a, a sort of I, I guess you might say it's a sort of spiral shape um, and you can see this amongst the world of many of the photosynthetic bacteria um, that, that live in aqueous environments.
Last but not least is the spirochete, and this is probably my favorite shape. Um, I mentioned yesterday in lab one of the very famous spirochetes, Treponema pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis. Um, spirochetes actually are literally shaped like corkscrews. I actually brought a little model with me of um, pipe cleaners, right? <laughs> so this is a spirochete shape here. And what the coolest thing about spirochete cells is how they move. They actually do move like a corkscrew. So they literally kind of move around in very viscous environments just like a corkscrew would move through a cork. So spirochetes, corkscrew shaped. There are some other unusual shapes besides those that we have mentioned here. Um, there are some cells that actually literally change shapes. They are shape shifters, right? Sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi. Um, but these shape shifters are called pleomorphic. There are some bacteria that have unusual shapes, like we may even see cuboidal cell shapes, um, and we sometimes see cells that can actually form surface projections. We call them prosthesia. So these are called prosthecate bacteria. So there are a lot of unusual shapes, um, not just those of the bacilli and cocci, but those are the more common of the shapes, and we tend to put things into those two categories as a general rule of thumb. Okay, at this point we can go ahead and talk a little bit about cell size and this is sort of a hard one because in general we tend to think of prokaryotes, right, whether or not we should have that term, um, as being smaller than eukaryotes and that may be a good general rule of thumb. Many of them do range from between 0.3 and 2 micrometers in diameter. Now let's compare that to what some of you saw on your slides yesterday. Um, many of you noticed that you had little algae that maybe were 250 micrometers. Holy cow! That's, you know, like 200 or 100 times larger than, than any of these sizes that are average within the bacterial world. But there are often exceptions to the rules as well, right? Wherever there's a rule, there is an exception. And one of those exceptions is a, a fabulous bacterium called Thiomargarita namibiensis. It's just, I mean, it's beautiful, right? Um, Thiomargarita namibiensis is a huge bacterium, about 750 micrometers. That is to say that it's almost as big as the period that you see on the page in front of you. Um, and so it's a very large, it's, it's actually visible to the naked eye. This is a picture of Thiomargarita, and you might have already remembered that, of course, the species name tells us from where this was isolated. So you're, you're right in thinking that this was um, isolated in the ocean sediment off the coast of Namibia. And Thiomargarita, thio refers to sulfur. So see, these are sulfur granules that make the cells so beautiful inside. Um, thio is one way of referring to sulfur. So Thiomargarita namibiensis. It was actually discovered in 1997 off the coast of Namibia, so it, um, it has not been known for all that long. Bacteria and archaea uh, generally reproduce via a process that we call binary fission. Um, this is a very simple replicative strategy where essentially the cell elongates and it duplicates its genetic material and then it cleaves off to form two separate daughter cells. I'm going to go ahead and show you a vis video and I'm going to go ahead and try to narrate that video that's going to show the process of binary fission. And so even right now as we speak, your, your your plates that you either coughed on or swabbed, right now the, the bacterial cells that landed in specific spots on that plate, they're dividing exponentially and forming eventually something that will be a visible sort of structure on the surface of the plate called a colony. So this video kind of gives us an idea for that exponential growth that we see via binary fission. Uh, I'll try to narrate it as we go. This is a YouTube video. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. Holy cow, that's a lot of bacteria. <laughs> 
This is a picture that you can find in your textbook. It's a very much cartoon picture of a prokaryotic cell, but it does allow us to get a little bit of, of an idea of the inter internal structure of a prokaryote. Uh, at the center, what looks like a, spag a blue spaghetti mass is actually the nucleoid of the cell, which is the genetic material. The genetic material is packaged in the, um, well, it doesn't necessarily have to stay in the center of the cell, it's shown there in this picture. Um, and it's packaged in kind of a gel-like mass that's very um, highly condensed, and we'll talk in a minute how uh, that is condensed. Well, actually, it'll be next time that we talk about that. Um, there are some other internal structures. For example, we see inclusion bodies that can sometimes be storage. We'll talk about some of the functions those can have. We see the little ribosomes, which you probably remember are the protein factories. We also see the more external structures, and that's where we're going to start today with the cytoplasmic membrane being one of our focuses. And then outside from there, we're seeing other external structures, a cell wall on most prokaryotes, as well as we see um, flagella on this particular, uh, one flagellum on this particular cell. Um, and then we also may see fimbriae, which are the smaller projections from the cell. So let's begin then our conversation with the cytoplasmic membrane, perhaps one of the most dynamic structures of the bacterial cell. You could think of the cytoplasmic membrane as being like the barrier that cordons off the interior of the cell from the environment. It is um, very important in regulating the flux of different molecules inside and into and out of the cell. So let's look at the, the cytoplasmic membrane and of course contrasting that to a simple phospholipid bilayer, we recognize the presence of proteins. Uh, one of the types of proteins that we see there is called either a transmembrane protein or an integral membrane protein. So if it spans the phospholipid bilayer, it's an integral membrane protein. Notice I've labeled the exterior and the interior just as we had in um, one of our prior pictures. The other type of protein that you see here is a peripheral membrane protein, meaning that it doesn't entirely span the, the membrane, um, but is just associated. Um, in this case, we're showing it as being associated with the integral membrane protein, but it might just simply be associated with the inner leaflet, uh, the phospholipid of the phospholipid bilayer, um, perhaps associated with the polar head groups of that phospholipid bilayer. So peripheral membrane proteins. Okay, there are some other things within the membrane. We see also in this particular view something called a hopanoid. Hopanoids are actually quite prolifer proliferous molecules that are found in the membranes of prokaryotes. They serve a functionally equivalent role to what cholesterol serves in our body. Um, bacteria do not have sterols, they do not have cholesterol, but hopanoids serve the role of modulating membrane fluidity. What that means in plain English is that if the membrane gets cold, hopanoids keep it from freezing. If the membrane gets hot, hopanoids keep it from melting. So they make uh, a huge role in stabilization of the membrane in regulating the fluidity of that membrane. Now the other thing that we need to label here is a carbohydrate group attached to a phospholipid. And I imagine you can um, guess that this is called a glycolipid putting together the two terms. So two different macromolecules there, right? A bunch of sugars linked by those glycosidic bonds, so a glyco lipid, and then we've got the lipid down below, the phospholipid below. Now we can also get glycoproteins, where there's a carbohydrate group attached to a protein. Um, we aren't showing that in this picture, but that also is something that you would see, um, not in, not only in a prokaryotic membrane, but in any membrane. So, and really that's, you know, the dynamics governing the membrane it applies to all systems. It, it's not just about prokaryotic cells. So we're going to see many of the rules of membranes being applied to all forms of life, um, and in particular that idea that they are a selectively permeable barrier for the cell. Now, 
with a picture like this, it makes the membrane look like it's very still, very static. And that's not the case. A membrane is in fact very dynamic. And integral membrane proteins, as I'm trying to show with these arrows, are free to diffuse laterally and rotate. They are very mobile, if you will. And this idea of a membrane that is dynamic um, was developed in 1972 by S. Jonathan Singer and Garthel Nich Nicholson. They came up with what we call now the fluid mosaic model. And that says so much in just a couple of words. Fluid meaning that it's a dynamic membrane where this motion, both phospholipids and proteins, can diffuse laterally and rotate. That's the fluid element of this model. Mosaic, meaning that it's a phospholipid bilayer with proteins interspersed just like a mosaic. So this describes the membrane as a dynamic structure with both proteins and lipids that can diffuse laterally and rotate within the bilayer. The fluid mosaic model is a very important model to remember. Um, I think it's hard to visualize. I've tried to make a bit of an animation. It is really cheesy and it's not awesome. And I'm sure you can find a better one online, but I, I, you know, I tried hard. So this gives, I hope, an idea of the dynamic nature of a membrane. You can see the integral membrane proteins diffusing laterally. I haven't really shown rotation, but you get the idea that this is a dynamic membrane. So uh, as, w as that animation comes to a close, I have a couple of questions for thought for all of you. First off, would the amino acids found in the membrane spanning region of an integral membrane protein love or hate water? So let me point this out. Say that we're looking at this region of the protein. Recognize that this region of the protein is really primarily exposed to just the hydrophobic tails right, of the phospholipids. So these hydrophobic tails are coming in contact with the particular amino acids that are in that region of the protein. So wouldn't we expect to find things like phenylalanine and valine and isoleucine and all of those water-hating amino acids? Whereas we might be much more likely to find water-loving amino acids out here exposed to the aqueous environment or down here exposed to the aqueous uh, cell interior. What about this question? Would it be easier to extract a peripheral membrane protein or an integral membrane protein? Now we don't, sh we're not showing any peripheral membrane proteins here, but let's draw one in. Would it be easier to extract this one that's just sort of uh, associated with the surface of the membrane? Or would it be easier to extract the one, say this one, that fully spans that membrane? Well, I think probably most of you are yelling at the computer screen and being like, duh, Rachel, be much easier to extract the peripheral membrane protein, right? Be much easier to, to extract that. And that's very true because all we would really need to do was just change the pH a little bit so that we would change the charge on the protein and it would probably dissociate with the membrane. Whereas when we look at an integral membrane protein, we would have to do so much more. We would have to use some sort of detergent like dissolves like, right, to dissolve the phospholipids and really get and free that integral membrane protein. So that would be a much more involved process. Let's ask this last question. What are some functions of an integral membrane protein? Well, this is, this is sort of a long answer, isn't it? Because there's so many different functions. Well, maybe this particular integral membrane protein serves as a receptor. Maybe there's some sort of molecule that binds to this particular protein, causing some sort of sequence of events inside. Maybe it sends a signal of some sort. So we recognize that many of the integral membrane proteins can be receptors. We also recognize that integral membrane proteins can be transporters. Maybe this one right here has um, a pore that is slightly hydrophilic. Sorry, I can't seem to draw in that direction tonight. Um, maybe it transports some molecule that influxes into the cell right, and gets in through that pore. <laughs> 
So transport, we could write some of these down, couldn't we? Receptors, signal, signal transduction. And in fact, while we might think that to be more common in eukaryotic systems, in fact, prokaryotes engage in a lot of signaling. We could also talk about transport. And another that I might like to add to this is actually a role in energy generation. If I can fit that on the page here. I bet most of you have heard of the electron transport chain in one frame or another. The members of the electron transport chain are mostly integral membrane proteins and they play that role in transferring electrons that of course came from foods like our fats um, and transferring them throughout the chain of carriers in the ETC, the electron transport chain, and using them to generate energy. So there are so many different functions of integral membrane and peripheral membrane proteins. On that note, have a fabulous weekend, and I can't wait to see all of you next week.